Yeah, so today, and um, just a show of hands, how many of you are more mathematical modeling types? Raise your hands. Couple, how many more computer science-y types? Couple, how many of you are more biology oriented? Okay, so what I decided to do, since it's sort of almost an impossible audience to make all of you happy, is uh, to cheat and give my job talk. I'm here, so it was successful, at least partially, okay? Uh, and then also bring in some, some measures in terms of how I structure my research, and then also some other new things we're working on. Uh, the most important thing right now is that we see each other's faces. Uh, I will be here in January. I'll be looking for new projects. I've met some of you already here. Uh, this is our fall break, so it's an opportunity for me to uh, meet people. Uh, and then, um, as I've been telling other people, uh, I will be bored come January. So please come talk to me. We can have coffee, and hopefully my presentation, the first you know, 15 minutes or so, gives you a sense of what I'm interested in talk a little bit about one of our more recent papers, which is on the more computer science side, and then come back into the interface where maybe I can make connections with you all. First, shameless plug. So uh, I will be teaching bioinformatics for EECS. It'll be the first time that EECS will offer uh, that class. Um, so I'm trying to find an ideal space because I do a lot of active learning. So this actually is from a couple of years ago, uh, but it's kind of great. We have a classroom at Notre Dame where the walls are all whiteboard, and I give my students markers and have them go at it. So if you're interested in doing more computer science oriented by informatics, uh, don't know the course number, it'll be cross-listed, so both undergraduate and graduate. Um, and you have to have some program experience. That's really the only requirement. Um, just to give you a sense that we'll go ahead and we'll be building in EECS more bioinformatics research and then tie that in as much as possible with what GSE is doing, uh, which I think is great. And we'll probably have immediately, hopefully, one GSE student. Big picture, uh, I try to show this slide a lot. This actually was a slide I showed in my PhD thesis a long time ago. It's corn, okay? And I like it because we didn't know that Tiocente in A was the ancestor to corn until we actually got sequencing happening. All right? It's obvious once you get genomes of Tiocente and maize, they're the same, but they look very, very different. If you make one change in corn in the middle, you create C. Okay? Now, obviously, knowing the exact change to make is one thing. And Native Americans, when they were domesticating corn, they went ahead by trial and error. Right? And we have lots of instances uh, both intentional and unintentional, uh, dogs. I have a golden retriever and a Labrador retriever. They both have a retriever, but they're very different dogs, right? And that happened over 100 years. Uh, and so one of the things that we're trying to do is, again, we use genome sequencing. We do a lot of omics data, um, but it's a means to an end, right? Variation in of itself isn't very interesting how variation actually is affected. And so it, when I gave this talk, when I first started at Notre Dame, in my job talk there, uh, I said it was two PhDs to do B and C, Fast forward 10 years, now with CRISPR, you can do that in a few weeks, right? So I won't get into any of the ethical issues. Uh, what I think is funny is I have a, a colleague of mine who's at USDA in Hilo. Uh, CRISPR plants are not GMOs. So you can go to the farmer's market and get corn that looks like C, and that would not be a GMO, right? And so again, we're in this interesting time where a lot of the things that were hard for us computationally to validate, now just CRISPR it, right? And we'll talk about why that may not be the best answer uh, later on, but that's kind of where we're coming from. I would not be a computational genomist if I didn't show you the slide. I will give you a different interpretation of the slide than most people will do. If I was in a clinical setting and I was actually in the med medical center earlier today, uh, sequence the world, right? Sequence every person, get all the medical history, put it in one big, big box, hit a button, and get all, all the information. What I think is good, and I'll show you some examples, is that I actually got my PhD, go ahead and use the pointer here, right here, where it sort of went and did a nosedive. We were customer number eight at 454 Life Sciences, which was super awesome. Uh, they are now defunct, right? So things are moving very, very fast. Um, but now that sequencing is inexpensive, most of my discussions aren't about sequencing lots of humans or lots of pathogens. It's I have this deep sea fish I think is really cool. I want to get a sense of its genome. Can I go ahead and sequence it? And the answer usually is probably, OK? Uh, I'll get into some issues why it's hard to go ahead and do that. But again, we work on very eclectic things uh, and, and very open. And again, everything I do. Uh, involves different groups. Other thing I will show you, as I always show in all my talks, is this is what I do. So if you get one thing out of this presentation, uh, being genome assembly guy is basically doing this. The only difference is you have tiny pieces or big pieces. Okay, and so a lot of the algorithms we come up with are doing this, but it's hard because there's no box, right? So we do de novo assembly of some deep sea fish. We can make some inferences about its biology. Um, but ultimately, we put it back together again. We don't know if we did it correctly. 
okay? There was a time when I was a grad student, we were very ignorant. We just would go ahead and do it and see what would happen, all right? Now we do other ways of making it better. Uh, and then my PhD was all about, instead of having four scientists, uh, we know there's scientists that have white lab coats on, uh, use 16,000 or 20,000, right? So using high-performance computing to go ahead and solve this problem that may take months and do it in a context of, of in this case, maybe hours, okay? Another thing I, I point out, and I mentioned this earlier today, um, you know, it starts somewhere. So if you have an idea and you may not think it's super interesting, um, we can just start there and then grow it. And so the best example is I have a new R01 that we started about six years ago, and I wish I was kidding, so I actually uh, validated this before coming here. Uh, we got started on it because a biochemist friend of mine had a grad student write a piece of code. That code was running for nine months in a computer in the back of the lab. It was not finished. She asked me if it would actually finish. I told her that that's hard. It's actually a computer science problem called the halting problem. You don't know it finishes until it actually finishes. We went ahead and fixed it, and then you know, six years later, we have $2 million and a new R1, right? So again, even the most simple things gives us an opportunity to figure out what could be an interesting computer science problem. Um, I went back and forth of whether or not to show you this, but I thought there'd be some grad students, uh, and I have two of my students in the audience, if they wouldn't care what I look like before being faculty, much younger and a and little bit more in shape. Um, but this is our Delcher, and I'm showing you this picture here because in many ways what I do in research was sort of uh, relates to him, and I'm thinking a lot about him because I'm giving a talk at my alma mater at Loyola. You can see here this beautiful campus in Baltimore, uh, and this is the famous Campanile and statue in Iowa State. Uh, and so when I was an undergraduate, I worked in teams, and we all had our strengths, and we sort of leveraged our strengths to make some research progress, and Art is the one to thank for that. Um, I took this picture, and you guys can't see, there is a message here. Uh, Art wanted to sort of put that in prosperity. This is a 20-year-old picture, but um, I don't remember what it was, okay? And then over here, uh, Ben Jackson is a theoretician. He's now a relatively high up executive of AOL. I'm surprised AOL still exists, but he gets paid very well to, to work for them. And TJ Wen, and again, we worked on some things that were fun projects that were published in really good venues, um, and we wouldn't be able to do it by ourselves, right? So even as grad students, we went ahead and found fun things to work on uh, and move things around. So today, what I also want to show you, and it's kind of weird doing it, but this is Craig Ventner. Do you guys know Craig How many of you know Craig Ventner? Raise your hands. A couple of you, okay. Um, he was my hero as an undergraduate because he was Art's boss, and Art was this, you know, superman who can do both biology and computer science when that wasn't really cool to do it. This is late 90s. Uh, and I like this figure because this actually is the Hemophilus influenza genome, and I know where this exists because it's actually in the conference room at JCVI in San Diego. Much nicer to be in San Diego than in Baltimore. I'm surprised I'm actually saying that. Um, but again, this technique and these methods are still useful today, right? So a lot of what we're talking about here uh, isn't new, and it goes back, you know, 20 years. Um, to give you a sense of how that sort of morphs and, and affects today, and I don't know if any of you are thinking about maybe working with me or at least collaborating with me, uh, this is my student Sean O'Neill up here. Um, we do what I call embedding, so I think it's important for my students to also be someone on the interface. So uh, when Sean asked me if he can go cut, collect butterflies in Mount Hood, I said yes. Uh, I tricked him, right? He spent a week. Uh, I think some of it was fun. I think he really enjoyed the camping and the drinking part of it but he only had to speak biology, right? When he mentioned MP completeness, he got blank stares. When he mentioned graphs, he got blank stares. But, you know, getting a sense of the problem, and he came back and uh, worked on that. So not surprisingly, a lot of what my group does is on this intersection, right? Now, again, all of our papers aren't in corners. They tend to be mixes and matches. But if you were to ask me, what does my group do? We come up with algorithms that solve biological problems, all right? And so Sean now currently is faculty at Oregon State, and he spends half his time teaching bioinformatics to a diverse group uh, and half his time doing research. Uh, one person in the audience probably is familiar with VectorBase. So we do a lot of work connecting biologists to cyber infrastructure. Uh, we have a large federal contract to do that. A piece of that will move here. Maybe most of it will move here at some point. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to see what biologists are actually doing, right? Sort of going out in the wild. And so we think that X is important, but when people go to VectorBase, they do Y. And that allows us to be involved with them and collaborate with them. Uh, and so to make some progress. And then more importantly, I think for some of you, since there's some computer, other computer scientists, um, we collaborate with other people. And so I mentioned uh, Doug Thane, Natesh Chawla, and Tiana Milankovic here uh, because they're good friends of mine, but because they've also gotten NSF grants independent of me that I fostered with at least one coffee slash beer discussion. I think the beer is more effective if you, in moderation, okay? Um, but again, a lot of computer scientists have been funded because if you go around the circle, you find gaps where 
yes, you need to build a system. That's not my research, but Doug can go write an NSF grant to build what we call Makeflow, which is a uh, uh, workflow system for biology, and then it's great. And so we take that code, we move it over here, and vice versa, right? So it's sort of a nice feedback loop of, of research. If you're not computer scientists, this is my crash course when students come talk to me and they want to be maybe my student on their interview. Uh, these are the three things that we do. Uh, the first is the simplest, right? For us, genomes are strings over an alphabet A, G, C, T. They can be big, they can be small, they can be fragmented, they can be assembled, but ultimately all we care about are these strings. Moreover, we care about where things differ, right? So here's a single nucleotide difference or a SNP between these individuals. Uh, I named them here because I have a colleague of mine who's now in Minnesota, and she would have her butterflies, and she would name them and then crush them and sequence them. I would just rather have them be A, B, and C. It'd be better to crush them and sequence them. Um, but we want to find differences. And moreover, not only just find differences, find differences that affect fitness. And so most of what we do is in speciation. Um, that may be interesting for you guys, but I agreed to give a third talk in January. And if I talk about that now, then I won't give a talk in January. All right, so sort of a plug for if you're really interested in speciation stuff, uh, come and talk to me. But today we'll sort of focus mostly on one and a little bit of two. Okay. So what is the plan for today? Um, so what I've decided to do is break it into three sections. There'll be a section on Hepagen and ADIT. Uh, if you've worked with bioinformaticians, you know we like making acronyms because we like the acronym. Um, and so this is work that Olivia Chaudhary and her fiance Ankush and I worked on together. It was a um, really high profile uh, CS conference paper. It was, it was published over the summer. I typically transactions in bioinformatics. Um, and again, this is my job talk. We've updated it, um, but give you a sense of what we've worked on and how it's useful. Uh, I'll talk about some other projects that may have some intersections with you all. And then I have one slide of some future work, but really I want you to ask questions. So if this goes well, I won't talk forever like most academics do. I'll end a little bit early and you guys can ask me questions. So what is Hapagen and Adit? One of the things that we're interested in is phasing. And this is sort of an easier problem uh, than the generic problem. We care about haploid genotypes for two reasons. One, my PhD was working on inbred crops, and all crops, even though they're diploid, effectively are homozygous and can be thought of as inbred. And we have a lot of interest in malaria, which is also haploid. And what will happen is that when you have unfazed data, you have these areas that you cannot determine with your technology, right? They're question marks. This SNP could be benign or it could be super useful, okay? If you know ahead of time that this position could be a C or a G or a T or an A, you have no information in sort of ahead of time of which combination there's four, right? You can have C and A, C and T, G and T, and G and A, right? And the phasing issue is can we use information, either directly or indirectly, such that we can say that this is a C and do that well, okay? Now, it turns out this is useful for other things, and so I had this here because I was giving a talk to the med school folks, disease susceptibility, demographic history, recombination. These are all really important, and so I'll kind of leave it here and go into the CS avenues, but then come back at the end and talk about our PO1, right? So the research we're actually doing in malaria that uses this. Uh, my British friends have used the term in anger. I like using that, right? So we'll use this in anger to solve something interesting for, for biology. Sticking theoretical, here are the various methods. So when you work in bioinformatics, odds are what you're doing is not new. You have to compare it to something else. Uh, there's Beagle, Impute2, and Link Impute. The one thing I will point out here, you don't have to read the slide, is that these are basically slow, require lots of memory, and they have a fault footprint. And so we define this statement here. And so typically what my students and I want to do is we want to do better, right? We're competitive. We want to be able to do it better than somebody else. Now you're academics, you never say that, so you always give your colleagues credit and then go off and do something better, all right? So hopefully I will convince you that our method is better. Um, but because we're computer scientists and, and sort of steeped in software engineering, oftentimes it also is lower memory and faster, right? So we have all three of those things. But ultimately, I don't want something that is slower. I want it to be better. Now, there are some exceptions. Um, I won't talk about it today, but we have a recent paper looking at finding structural variation. And our method is as good as other methods, but we have a new algorithmic formulation for it using a graph structure. Uh, and then finding the, uh, the structural variation is 100 times faster, 
right? So again, it's not necessarily we don't have any better results. It's as good as the other tools, um, but we can do it much, much faster with our new formulation. And the idea is that that will then help others use that formulation and improve their methods. So one of the things we came up with, and this is super simple, so I'll walk you through this, and if you have questions, um, stop me and we can, we can discuss. So in the context of malaria, what happens is that you have two parents. These are haploid, just a single DNA string, okay? And then the red parent is resistant to a drug, and the green parent is sensitive. What we want to be able to do is traditional statistical genetics. We're going to create crosses, create progeny, and then look at the progeny and see if they're actually sensitive or resistant, right? Um, and so what happens is that if you have an unknown position here, uh, what do you do? Most methods, what they will do is they will come up with some sort of global reference system. So I know that this position matches this position matches this position, and then uses that information to make a sense of that. It works. Beagle and Link Compute do that. Um, the issue is that everything I work on does not have that. Right? If you're working on anything ecological, you have no genetic map, you have no uh, reference system. So what Olivia came up with, having spoken to biologists over, gosh, at least a year, is what if we just look at the neighborhood? We have really dense data. The dense data causes everybody else issues. What if we have, instead of having 100 markers, we have 100,000 SNPs? We have really, really dense information. And let's say we say that if it's green here and green there, we make the hypothesis that that is green. All right? Now, we can be wrong, but the idea is that because recombination tends to occur in these blocks, this could actually work out really well. And so what we did with the PO1 in mind is we created simulated data. Now, I think we, I have a uh, sort of love-hate relationship with mixed data uh, that's simulated because on one hand, you know what truth is. Other hand, you don't know if it's actually right, okay? But the problem is, and I won't talk about it here, um, we had a sort of ace in our back pocket where we had a method where we could create up to 75 or 100 samples of progeny. And for whatever reason, all the previous crosses had 30. So we wanted to create something that would be similar to what we would generate for our PO1 for the grant, which was funded. Uh, and so we used HB3 and DD2 that I had worked on about five years prior. Uh, one of them sensitive, HB3 is sensitive, DD2 is resistant, and sort of made our own, own progeny. And what you can see here from Olivia's slide that she presented, and I presented here in February, uh, by and large, we make lots of correct decisions with quick compute. Right? If you just go ahead and use a very simple thing, if it's two neighboring things are green, it's a green, uh, you know, almost all of them are correct. The 496 you see here are as ambiguous. You have a red and a green, or a green and a red. Right? You're not quite sure where that is. And then the red ones are we make a mistake. Right? We have two green ones, but there's actually a crossover that happened. It's kind of tiny, we can't actually find it. Uh, and so we, we've, we have it on and off, and it's an option, but this gives you a sense of how we can work on that. Now the real big innovation, and this is where the EE flavor came in. So Ankush actually has a PhD in, in EE, is doing a postdoc at Harvard uh, and such, is a lot of signal processing methods where you can go ahead and use these sliding windows and compute distance. We're using Hamming distance, which is very simple. But remember, these are from the same parents, right? When we go ahead and look at the progeny, it's either A, red, or B, green, and it shouldn't have no differences between them. So we can structure these windows such that it may have missing data nearby, but it has information in that window, okay? And then what we then do is, for those 496 remaining candidates, we generate all possible pairs, right? So we have no reference system, and find which one makes the most sense. And we have an adaptive window such that we want to use as over here as possible, but if we don't have that, we'll move over, right? So we want to get enough information from the window to do that. Uh, your eyes are probably glossing over, so this hopefully makes more sense, all right? What most methods do is they look at this position, they fix that position based on some metadata, some third-party data, and they say, well, this position is either a zero or a two, it won't be a zero. Now, this is the diploid example because, again, in our case, it's either a zero or one because it's haploid. If it's diploid, it could be either a zero, a one, or a two. What we do is basically create an adaptive window where we look at the neighboring region we say if this matches, and then that matches, and it's all one, we're much more confident it will be a one. And we do this on the fly, right? So again, we don't actually uh, compute this window. This window is defined by having a similar neighborhood of gene calls. Questions on this, because it will be important for the rest. Okay, so if not, 
We then worked on real data. Um, this is near dear to my heart because it's all agriculture focused. So we worked on grapes, we worked on apples, and we worked on corn. Uh, these are the number of samples. There's way more corn data available than anything else. How many missing genotypes? What we do is we actually call the variants and then we pretend that we don't know these, right? So we have ground truth. So we actually have all the SNP calls and then in this case we decided to not know over 2,000 and this will be the actual file size. And so Monet et al, or Money et al, how you pronounce that, um, they've used these data sets and they compute these information. Genotype error is how many times you're right or wrong, depending on your perspective, right? So this is how many times you're wrong over how many predictions you make, the runtime, and memory footprint. And so if we look at it, these are the three data sets. Here's the grape data set, the apple, and the maze. You can see that for grape, for whatever reason, quick compute is awesome, okay? It only makes one mistake when it does a simple thing, right? And so our, our performance on grape is much better, not because we're smart, we just made the good guess, okay? These are the ones that can't be imputed. Again, one red, one green, or vice versa, and about 10% error rate on those. Here is Apple. Again, by and large, we do really well when we do the quick impute. Our error rate for these guys is 10%. But again, we're stacking it towards being more correct because we combine both of those, right? And then for maze, again, we do really well on quick impute, and we have these many, and again, a little bit worse. So we want to compare with and without. What we did was we actually looked at what does QI do, right? So if we just run our method, because if you go back and look at this, in many ways, what Quick Compute's doing is just looking at one of these, right? So with Adaptive, we look at six, or seven, or eight, or how many we can actually go ahead and look at uh, confidently. Whereas Quick Compute, we just say, okay, well, this is a one, and that's a one, so that has to be a one, right? Do we have more information when we go further out? And what this slide is showing is that when you get further out, you get more mixing, right? It's less obvious when you have bigger chunks of if it's this or that, right? So. In many ways, when Olivia was hanging out with the malaria biologists and they were talking about their recombination maps, and she's like, oh, let's try this, uh, it worked, right? And so you can see that the error rate, it's not substantially worse, but it is worse, right? So the error rate with and without is 3% versus 2%. This is with and that's without. And the runtime, obviously, is much faster. So you have to say, okay, look at neighboring region, two green, green, go, right? And so it's much faster to go ahead and do that. Um, and again, some of them are a little bit better. So maze, for example, Right, it has about 9% error rate, depending on what you look at, and only slightly better when you use Quick Compute. All right, so if things have gone well, I'm about two-thirds done, assuming about 10 minutes for questions. So questions on any of the previous stuff before I go through the results? So I'm just confused, when you say Quick Compute, is that classical methodology, or is that QI and QI? Yep. So both of these are our own algorithms. There is no classical way of doing it. And so what, with QI, um, what we do is this, where we look at the neighboring region. So we know, because it's basically a rad marker or some sequence, the neighboring SNPs, right? Because again, it's a really tiny window and it's next-gen sequencing. With priority impute, what we do is we actually compute this distribution of what potentially is parental allele, but it's disjoint. We don't know they actually align or not until we compute having distance. And so we want to find, for the progeny, the ones that are over here are the ones that come from the same parent. And we go ahead and, and do that. This information assumes that the 001 and 112 are as such because they're from the same parental strain. Right? But we don't know for sure. We're predicting it. Right? We're saying because these are similar. Now, of course, if you get bigger, you get more confident in this actually is the right parent. But then you get more mixing. And you're not unclear how, how that would work. Other questions? Yeah, Trenton. So, is there any good reason why the grape data seem to be cleaner or to seem to you know, have less error? Yes, yeah, so the question for those of you who are listening is why is the grape uh, really useful? Uh, the, the true answer is we don't know. Uh, if you pick grape first, obviously you'd win and that would be great. Okay. Uh, it turns out that this is, I think, is it Pinar Noir? I don't drink wine. I think Pinar Noir grapes. And because they come from one part of France, they're incredibly inbred. And so you get longer stretches where they're the same. So the fact that you can actually go ahead and look at that is just a consequence of the fact that uh, the French like that particular variety of grape. Lots of them are, are basically siblings, right? They're very closely related. And therefore, when we do this, it works better because there's just less diversity in that set. Uh, corn's the same thing. You can see that's the case. And then um, with apple, 
Uh, that's normal, but again, most Apple comes from one or two rootstocks, and so again, the diversity in that system is not very high, and so therefore this works better. Yeah. So kind of in relation to what you were just saying, would this, would you expect that this uh, program would work less well on um, species that are not cultivated, so like wild species that have higher levels of diversity. Yeah, exactly. So, so if you're not familiar with, and I'll, I'll show you some data in the second part of that. Um, yes, definitely. Um, and we went ahead and did that and came up with a method to address that. Um, but I'll show you that in a minute. All right, so let's go through uh, some results. So this table can be interpreted as possible. So these are different methods. So the previous three rows are the sort of competitors, okay? This is the error rate, right, for our method, and it's in blue. Uh, the runtime in the memory, and the blue values are the best, right? Now, granted, 14 seconds versus 18 seconds is a big deal. If it was three minutes versus 10, it's still not a big deal. Let's go get coffee and come back, right? So we're not talking about huge runtimes, but as we scale up to the PL1, uh, this may matter, right? So again, we want to make it be more efficient because we don't really care about this. We care about the, the massive data that we're generating from the grant. Um, and if we go ahead and just look at the, oops, wrong one. Uh, go back here. Um, the next one, and just look at the ones that are second best, right? You can see that, again, here, second best is 9.5. It's three times better in our method. Here's Apple, it's 7.4 and 5.3. Not that great, but still an improvement. And we use much less memory. And the largest data set was Maze. And you can see here, again, it still takes, you know, whatever that would be, um, 720 divided by 60 uh, sort of minutes, and our rate's more than two, right? And so when I see this, I want this difference to be really big, and so I gave Olivia an academic high five because it was, it was better, um, and then it also happened to be a little bit faster, right? And so again, this isn't a huge difference, and that's isn't a huge difference, but then we can go ahead and get better performance. And then the last one here is the plasmodium, and again, it's not that great. This is probably the easiest data set, um, but still substantial. So to get to the question that was just asked before, um, what about things that are outcrossing? What about things that aren't haploid and easy? So we came up with what we called Addit M, and uh, if you have any ideas, let me know. Uh, but what happens in computer science is you write a paper, it's great, you get to go and you get nominated for a best paper, you feel warm and fuzzy inside. You say, do a journal paper, it's due in two weeks. What do you do in two weeks, right? Uh, get a lot of work done and don't sleep and drink a lot of coffee, right? But unfortunately, we had to come up with some results too. And so what we did was we actually used a very simple uh, SVM model in the scikit-learn Python class, and we used a bunch of individuals from chromosome 20 in human, and then asked what happens as we get more and more missing data, and what happens when we actually vary our training set. Now remember, these individuals um, are not related, they're not SIBs, right? I don't have a thousand brothers and sisters I, that I know of. Uh, these are actually different individuals, but because we're relatively homozygous, we can use this as a good test case for moving things forward. And so when you go ahead and look at the results, and I'll walk you through this table, A is we fix the training set. So we use 75% of the 2400 as training sets to figure out where the windows are. And then the one, two, and five is how much is missing, right? Having five means more data has to be imputed. Here, we fix it at the highest number of missing genotypes, but we vary the training data set, okay? And you can see that Beagle, is the only tool that actually is used for this. When we have very little missing data, we do awesome, but by and large, we do awesome across the board. Okay, so our error rate is much lower, uh, and again, our runtime also rocks, but I don't care much about that, right? So again, we can go and, and compute something, you know, literally more than 20 times faster, and our error rate's five times better, okay? This is more interesting because, again, when you have less training data set available, when you have more training set available, it doesn't quite help. Right, so we can go ahead and have lots of differences here, um, but when we have lots of training data set, Beagle's able to accommodate it, and it's not that stark. So we went ahead and did lots of different comparisons in the paper. You can go ahead and look at it if you want, uh, not simply transactions, but the basic idea is that, again, in this case, we're still better, but it grows with how much training data is available. We're able to use the SVM to, again, get a better sense of what's going on with more training, which makes sense, uh, and see. Now, what I wanted to do, because I want to make sure this was correct, was what if we try our old method. So we used to call um, uh, the previous method is now added NM, and it's way worse, right? So when you apply the simple method on outcrossers, it's super bad, don't do it. 
but when you apply the SVM method with training data, you do better, right? And so again, we're still relying upon having available data, um, but again, when we have data available for human, you can actually get much better performance with this SVM model. There are other ways of doing this. If you have any ideas, let me know. Again, this is something we did literally in two weeks before it was due. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, the, the runtime the, sorry, the amount of time it takes to um, do the training sets? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so these are sort of punch lines. Um, so again, the, the, the big punt of that, that paper that came out in the summer is that we have high accuracy, we use these adaptive windows, we can have less time in memory, including even the training time, uh, and then we, we don't require reference data, but when we do have it, we can use a simple model and our framework and do much, much better. Okay, and that's sort of a win across all boards. So I want to talk about other projects. Um, and this, again, the whole point of being here is I hope, I don't know how much is a good number, five of you email me and come to my office in MinCal in the spring, maybe three of you, more than that, we'll see. All, right, all of you are welcome and, and hopefully come. Uh, talk about other projects we're doing to get a sense of what we care about and um, how it will affect you. Um, I will show pictures of mosquitoes. So most of what we do is on the mosquito side. Uh, I show Anopheles gambi pest here because it's still the flagship genome in Gambi. Uh, multiple people spent years of their lives making this good. It will never happen again. It's sort of a one-time thing. Uh, and I highlight Finestis because we've gotten a grant to work on Finestis and Arabiensis is close enough to Gambi. Maybe we can use information to, to make sense of that. Uh, Finestis is the worst assembly uh, but most important biomedically, right? And Minimus is the best assembly, and it's not very interesting, right? And there's reasons for that, and we can get into that offline, uh, hopefully over a beer. Um, are you familiar with N50? How many of you know what N50 is as a measure? A couple of you, okay. So what N50 basically does, it says, I have an assembly. The assembly should be 225 million characters. Let's look at the biggest piece and see if I get to half of that, so 112, right? If the Biggest piece is 112 million, and 50 would be 120 million. If I take the biggest piece, the next biggest piece, the next biggest piece, and whatever, and the last piece that gets me over 120 million is 671,000, that's the N50. So it gives you a sense of how fragmented it is, right? And you can see there's a huge differences in this number. Genome sizes should be exactly the same, but we see very differences between that. And so one of the things that we were thinking about, and we have thought about, and I'll be honest, even though this is being streamed and recorded, is that we and others have done measures like this where we do what's called a bake-off. We take our favorite assembler, we run it on some truth data. Um, if you care about errors, you'd use Abyss, but everything else isn't very good, okay? Uh, the reason why there's so many rows on this table is that these are largely national products. So when sequencing was done, each country had their sequencing center, each sequencing center had their assembler. Uh, if you were curious, Abyss is the Canadian one. Okay, so they have fewer errors, but they do pretty poorly on everything else. And what we did in the past, what we call meta-assembly, which is to take the best of both, right? Take the best of this, combine it to the best of that, okay? Um, this morning I had a really good southern breakfast that had a Midwest flavor to it. I was very appreciative, but it's sort of a fusion of ideas. We can do fusion of assemblies. Uh, and the problem with that is that it works. We've gotten awards for doing it, but it can never be used again, right? So you write it once, apply it to your genome, and it's never useful again. Now, we, we say it is. You guys can download it and use it. It's just really hard. And so what I had one of my more recent students, Shenlong, think about is what if we use newer technology, so there's newer machines, PacBio and actual Nanopore, and what we can do is say, and it's more true for Nanopore than PacBio, but trust me that these are the case, that this piece is correct, right? It's only 8,000 characters, but there's no assembly. And what we can do is basically validate, relative to this rubric, of how well our assembly is. If I get no alignments in this region here, that could mean the assembly is wrong. All right? doesn't mean for sure it is, but it means it's questionable. And so what we can do is validate these segments, the red segment, the green segment, and the sort of bluish segment here, and make these gaps, then put it back together again. Okay? And I don't have any uh, sort of kids' books in this talk, but um, Humpty Dumpty. Right, so Humpty Dumpty's on top of the wall, push it over, put it back together again, right? Use the information in third-party data, put it back together again. Now, this was actually the most traction I got from the medical school folks, because it's the same method to find structural variation in cancer genomes, right? The difference is that we know it's wrong because this gets fused together in some tumor, we're gonna be able to find that. So these X's here, 
are misassemblies, but you can do the same thing for finding structural variants, and they were super excited to apply it to their breast cancer samples. Uh, I'm very visual, so I will show you a picture. This is a dot plot. This actually is code I developed with art many, many years ago. That's called Mummer. Uh, if it's correctly assembled, it will be a blue line that looks like this, or a red line that looks like that, okay? We've taken E. coli and basically made it wrong, all right? So whenever you see a red area, we've inverted it, we've did translocations, all the things you would imagine going wrong in an assembly or going wrong in a cancer cell, we've made here. And the question is, can we take real pack bio data and fix it, right? We know what the truth answer is, and then go ahead and do that. And we apply our method, and because E. coli is circular, this is correct, right? Now you may be able to see here these little blue dots on there. The packed bio data we used for that paper that was published about eight months ago now is about 80% correct. So when we go ahead and put it back together again, we can glue this piece and this piece together with long reads, but the inside portion is not very correct, right? And so we since have come up with a method that's in BioRxRV. We're hoping to get in bioinformatics to correct long read data that fixes this. Uh, I won't go into that detail, but that's the idea. If you were curious, since I know some of you care about arthropods, what a tick assembly looks like, it's sort of like this. You see there's little blue pieces and red pieces, but there's no rhyme and reason, right? So again, a lot of the things I work on are highly fragmented. Um, the hardest probably is spider. So the Black Widow is done, and it's in three million pieces right now, okay? And so again, there's no way with short read data to assemble a spider. Maybe this will be helpful. And we apply our method to it. It's not a miracle worker, right? But it gets better, right? We get over a tenfold improvement in continuity by using long read data for this. Um, and so we actually have a journal paper that came out in BMC Genomics. It was the journal venue for that conference. Um, what's interesting about it was we determined that if you have money, sequence it again, right? No matter what you can do with Humpty Dumpty, it's not as good as putting Humpty together, together independently, all right? And so uh, feel free to go ahead and look at that paper, but that's what we were working on. And here's the last data point. And you can see that, again, this is the yeast, uh, Circumaxis W23. QUAST is a method for determining uh, assembly quality. And so if you get a great assembly with 30 pieces, it has at least 100 mistakes in it, right? So again, it's getting your exam from your undergrad done, and it's all filled out, but all the questions are wrong, right? And so what we do is provide a less continuous assembly. So again, there's more pieces, but we reduce the errors, and we reduce the locations, and so on. So we've been using this in different contexts. Um, and the one that actually is the most interesting is actually beetle, tribolium. So tribolium, they have no more money, and so they can't do it again. And so we're trying to see if we can come up with the best sort of halfway house to get them better. All right, so I wanted to get done in about 10 minutes. So the one thing I, I promised that I would present, because somebody in the audience is working on this, is sketching. Uh, how many of you have heard of sketching before, or Minhash? People in my, work in my lab? OK, and one more. All right, so I'll go through the details. Uh, one of the things I'm really interested in doing is, um, and this is, goes back to when I was an undergrad, cause is a, a class of algorithms called locality-sensitive hashing. The most famous of one is probably called a bloom filter. Right? A bloom filter is an oracle. You have data, and you ask the oracle, is my item in the data set? And bloom filter either says no or maybe. Right? If it's maybe, you still have to look further, but you have either a no or a maybe. Okay? Uh, and so what we want to do is create these fingerprints that I'll explain in a few slides. It takes a big data set and reduces it down to a smaller one, where we can go ahead and use that to get a sense of are things actually similar. And so I won't show any real slides, but I will remind you about Jacquard similarity. And so Jacquard similarity is defined as the intersection of two sets over the union. If the sets are exactly the same, Jacquard similarity is one. If they're completely different, it'll be zero. Okay, and, and hopefully you remember your algebra here. Uh, you all look relatively young. How many of you remember Alta Vista as a search engine? More of you. Okay, you know more about Alta Vista than you do about Minhash. Interesting. Uh, so, a lot of these algorithms that we're using in genomics were invented by Alta Vista to do indexing. Why? A lot of web pages were plagiarized, right? They take a Wikipedia entry, they copy and paste it, and you have the same words, right? What, and they move it around, so it's not exactly the same, right? But again, this paragraph and this document is over here. And so when you use a card similarity, it gives you a sense of how plagiarized a web page is, right? Because it has the same number of words, 
then the words will be the same. And so again, the union of those words would be the same. And it may not be in the right order, but you can get a sense of that. So again, a lot of the methods for doing uh, what we'll call minhash are invented this way. Um, but we don't care about web pages, we care about sequences. So what do we do? Here's a slide that I've stolen from my friend, Richard Corwin, who's not NIH. He was a PhD student at Maryland before from his uh, assembly paper. Um, and we do a lot of work with k-mers. A k-mer is just a substring of size three. All right, so these are all the three-mers. You take this string, S1. The first k-mer is cat. The second one is ATG. The third one is CGG, and so on. All right, take a sequence, put it in a blender, and come up with all the overlapping three-mers. Do the same thing for a second string, okay? Just like a web page, it moves things around, doesn't matter where they are, as long as you actually have those words in the text. And then what we call it minhash, so we come up with some number of functions, usually it's more than four, maybe it's a thousand or two thousand functions, depending on your data set, and you apply the hash function to all the k-mers in the two different strings. Right, so that's the hash part of minhash. The min is I take this column and the minimum value gets put into a sketch. So for m hash functions, I create an m valued vector where that value is the minimum of all those k-mers. Does that make sense? Why is this cool? You do not have to assemble the data. You do not have to do anything besides just go ahead and take all the pieces, apply the functions, and create a sketch. And then when you compute similarity, if you were in my class, you do sequence alignment, which would be time proportionate to this size times that size. With sketching, all you have to do is look at these vectors and say, is this the same number, yes or no? Right? Same number, yes or no. So very fast to do the overlap. And you'd estimate your card similarity by how many numbers in common over how many numbers total. So in this very simple example, the estimated card similarity is 0.5 because there's two things in common. And those two things correspond to these, this former you see right here. Okay? Now the problem with this is it's very much like black magic because how do you pick the size of the camer? How do you pick how many functions? What number here is good enough or not? Those are all separate questions. Okay? But one of the things that we were working on, and this is my version of it, more, more so than the more recent version, is can we use this to do what amounts to a sample blast? I have some unknown mosquito from some location. I want to figure out what the most similar mosquito is, right? I can take a barcode and blast it and see, but that may not work very well. And so what I'm showing you on this slide is a phylogeny of three uh, mosquitoes. Gambi and Clutzi are now new species. Bamako is actually a form of the black one. These lines you see here are actually in aggression. So these mosquitoes can create hybrids, right? So this mosquito here is mostly Gambi, but it has some Bamako. This is mostly Clutzi, but it has some Bamako. Uh, and the grad student who's now a postdoc didn't talk to me for a week because we were able to reproduce exact figure with the exact grouping with doing no assembly and no snip calling at all. The skis are so different, we can just go ahead and create the distance metrics of Zuccard similarity. Just go ahead and do sketching, create these vectors, and then do hierarchical clustering on it to figure out which ones are more similar, make a tree, and it was like this. And um, I won't repeat what she said, because this is being recorded, okay, with some very choice words, um, but we've seen this in other contexts, where again, it may not be the exact distance you would get with the super fine grain method, um, and even the integration, the samples that have mixtures of blue and orange do show up here. So we can actually reproduce and see integration. And so we're currently working with um, a copy on vector base on this. We're going ahead and build, basically building a sample blast where if you have a mosquito, you don't need to assemble it, just take your read data from Illumina, put it into the sketcher, go ahead and create a, a sketch, and then go ahead and use this information to figure out which is most closely related to this. It's also used for genome sequences. So the program we use for doing sketching here is called MASH. Uh, and MASH actually could be used to search all of GenBank. An example of this is um, I had a paper, uh, a project that was usually published looking at these two bacteria that produce a natural product, and they didn't know what species it was. And it turns out you can take the bacteria of unknown species, sketch it, search all sequence things, find the most closely related one, and actually is correct. So the 16S barcode was wrong for that species, but the sketching actually was correct. So. We've been playing around with this a lot, and, and hopefully one of my students comes here and can work on this, but that's the idea. And this will probably be more of a, an Oak Ridge thing, um, but that's one of the things we're working about, looking at, not looking at mosquitoes, but looking at environmental samples. So we can take different samples from an environment, from a lake, from a river, from a desert, and do the same thing and figure out which ones are closely related based on shared species, not shared content. Um, the last thing I'll talk about here, 
so I want to finish up a little bit early. Um, this is the hardest thing I've worked on. So if you're looking for a project, work on Finestus. Uh, so there's these two types called Flonzo and Carabina that you cannot detect unless you carry a type. Take a mosquito, get its chromosomes, look at them. And there's actually a flow chart that determines which is Flonzo and Carabina. This is actually the first time ever that we've been able to determine Flonzo and Carabina. This is Flonzo and that's Carabina using sketching, right? So we can actually now take just raw data individuals. What's interesting about this though is that this guy here and this guy here were actually not the out groups. There's another one that's out here. And it turns out that there was a lot of fungus growing on that mosquito. It sounds kind of disgusting, but it's been in the lab for like 20 years. And this mosquito was sketched and the fungus was sketched. And obviously the one with the fungus that was a mixture was over here because it was not very similar. So we can actually also use this for finding the contamination. So it's not intentional. Uh, but now we actually go ahead and do that to figure out for all of our ancient samples, which ones look wonky because they end up over here, right? So again, a more applied application of using sketching. All right, the last two things I want to talk about, and this is something to work with Mike Gilchrist, who kindly introduced me today. Um, we have different measures of how common codons are. So remember, there's 64 codons. There's 20 amino acids from your microbiology. There's redundancy there. And so a 100% max means that you use the most common one in the genome. And the 100% min means you use the least common one. And these are two different models. This is way more complicated, but again, looks at can we take the codon usage of a genome and predict how well it folds, right? And so this YKB on the y-axis up here means it, slows, it folds slower, and down here means it slows faster, right? And we can go ahead and use this as a proxy of what's actually happening. This is a busy slide, so I apologize. I'll sort of walk you through the various bits. What we're interested in is what's called co-translational folding, all right? So you have a protein, and when I was a student, I was told the protein gets unfolded and then all automatically folds back together again. That's not true, okay? There are proteins that need help, right? And so you can think about these red areas that have lower min-max values as either speed bumps or flashing school lights, depending on your way home today, right, to slow you down. So you have this frequency, again, it's not the sequence conserved, it's actually the frequency at which it gets translated. And you can see in very diverse species, it ends up being read at the same location, right? That means that at the same location in the proteins, you need to slow down, okay? And if you look at the structure of that protein, you can see that those slowdown areas tend to occur in front of these more complicated areas, right? So this is a contact map. What this means is that, say, take these two alpha helices here. If the atoms are close enough together in the structure, but far away in the sequence, it would show up as over here, right? So again, further away, so, so this line are basically amino acids that are connected in the protein, the actual linear sequence of the protein. And then this stuff corresponds to, again, elements that are far away in sequence that are folded together in the structure. And we actually have methods, and we just published a paper in scientific reports we can actually use this information, take this structure, make a map, and then use that to predict if it's gonna be protein X or protein Y or protein Z, right? So we can actually go ahead and do structure to function and then also combine it with that. And so you can see here, this H selenium, I know that actually is, is mostly blue, but you can see a little bit of red at those positions, right? So not only is it there, um, it's also relative. And again, the sequence may be different, but the actual frequency of it is actually conserved. And so uh, we have a new R1 at the end of year two working on this, and Gabe Wright is not here. He's actually in Norway right now, um, but he'll be coming and visiting and hopefully coming here as well to Tennessee to, to join me, but he's been working on this for the last year or so. All right, so I'm kind of out of time. I'm gonna skip this. Um, all I wanna do is give Gabe a plug. So this is how it looks in practice. Um, and so this is actually a, a paper we got published in Protein Science, my first protein paper ever. Um, and you can see that we can actually go ahead and look at the min-max value here in, in uh, blue, and then the RRT is what you'd expect at average, right? So you just take at random and use a codon frequency and don't have any selection for either a less common or more common, you see this sort of purplish line here, and then whenever it goes below here, then that will be interesting. And so one of the things in that protein paper that's really cool is that what we wanna be able to do, go back here, is um, if you want to take a human protein and translate it in a E. coli factory, make lots and lots of copies, it may be that your protein looks like this, right, where you have lots of red. 
Because again, the red is actually going to be blue in your species, right? Uh, and so we actually are coming up with a method that takes all this information and then can go ahead and harmonize this and actually come up with what would be the actual sequence to make the protein that's most happy in that particular organism, right? And has the same ups and downs and therefore will be more effective. All right, so I have one more minute. Um, I figure some of you may be more eco-focused and more modeling-focused. This is actually one of the harder things I've worked on recently, uh, and I'm, I'm a little bit depressed to talk about it. So my, I have colleagues of mine who have since moved on that have looked at pollen cores. And what pollen cores basically are is that you have these lakes, typically up in uh, the UP of Michigan or the sort of mitten of Michigan, and you take a big tube, you put it in the bottom of the lake, you put liquid nitrogen in it and freeze it and pull it back up. Right? And the idea is the sediment from 10,000 years ago is down here in the lake. The sediment from five years ago is up here in the lake. And you can actually go ahead and look at what amounts to ancient fossils in the lake bed. Because right? leaves fall in, they settle in the bottom of the lake, and they sort of move down over time. Uh, and so what you usually do is you go ahead and you cut out a cookie, which is basically a, a slice of that cylinder. And the reason why I'm depressed about it is you actually have to count by hand how many pollen grains are in there. So this figure up here is multiple years of a poor grad student's life. They actually went ahead and did 30 cookies and counted by hand how many pollen grains are in there. But what's cool is you can see that over time, as the ice sheet receded, right, all Michigan and Indiana were under ice 10,000 years ago, you had a lot of pine, and then over time you get less pine and you get more birch, right? You can sort of see the transition uh, of the various species. And so what we've been able to do is actually extract DNA from these cookies. And instead of actually counting by hand how many pollen grains are in there, how many sequences we get. And what's cool is that there are species of birch that you cannot tell apart in pollen, but you have different SNPs in there. And so we can make these pretty chronoplots where you can actually click and zoom in and see for each uh, sort of epoch uh, going back 10,000 years, how much pine in the DNA you absolutely observe versus how much is in the pollen. Um, you can click on it, it expands, and then we can also look at haplotypes in the data as well. Uh, and what's cool about this is we're actually, I, I finally f solved this problem myself over the summer. Uh, you get weirdness because some of the cookies have leaves in it, and the leaves have more DNA from that leaf, right? And so you get these huge outliers where you get tons of data from birch, and you can see in the cookie there's a birch leaf there, right? <laughs> and they didn't actually pull out by hand with tweezers all the tissue, right? So, so we have some issues there, but we've been able to actually go ahead and correct for that and find haplotypes and then go ahead and connect that. So, so again, we were doing a lot of modeling, and so there's actually a, a project called Paleon. We're actually coming up with mathematical models for looking at climate change and how species come in. That's more theoretical, and it's using this DNA data to sort of to calibrate it, right? Can we use this to get sense if our models are actually working? All right, so here's the last slide. Um, went a little bit over, you have to ask questions. Uh, so the first thing that we're doing, and this is again um, for Becky who stepped out, uh, but there's a lot of these, these new CDC centers, including Tennessee, has, has one part of it. Uh, and we're trying to go ahead and make connections for looking at surveillance of mosquitoes. Uh, Trent, who's in the audience, is working on this a little bit. Uh, and the idea is, right now, it's very local. So each city or each state collects data about each gypti. Uh, can we come up with ways of incorporating that to make better models, right? Do more epidemiology based on mosquito abundance. Uh, we're doing a lot of alignment-free methods for looking at aquatic ecosystems. That's work that Dave Malik does in this, in this audience. Uh, and then we're also doing some more fine-grained work with Aedes and Zika with a friend of mine at Penn. So that's a more mosquito-focused. That was for Becky, who stepped out. So I will redo these if you have any questions. Um, but again, we're very open. We're very collaborative. So any idea you have that would be interesting, more than happy to work. And one of the great things about being a new professor is I have startup with students, so we don't even have any funding, right? So again, I think that will be great to sort of get things off the road, not worry about how we pay for it, just do the cool science and then do the funding later. So thank you for your time. Here are some acknowledgments. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Now I'm going to get some coffee because it's my second talk today, so hopefully I can talk for five more minutes. Yeah, Albert. Sorry. From these uh, pollen core data, do you think one can actually get some sort of population genetics data on, on the structure, the size of the... Okay, I'm done with my question. <laughs> so, so for those of you listening online, uh, Albert's question is, can you actually do population genomics? Yes, I think the biggest issue, and this is, again, proof of concept, and um, we do have some more money that we can go ahead and look at. 
uh, any HNDNA sample is mostly non what you care about, right? So when they sequence Neanderthals, they get 1% Neanderthal and 98% is, is bacteria. And so what we did here is we actually have these bead systems that actually enriches. So you basically, these are all chloroplast markers. We have chloroplast data. We use chloroplast because the pollen can fly around, whereas chloroplast is only in the leaves, right? And so when the leaves fall into the lake, we know that the sequences we see here are actually physically close enough for the leaf to fall into that lake, right? Versus the pollen that will go all over the place. And the problem is that our yields like one to two percent. So for every data point, every read we generate from these samples, we throw away 99, 98 of them, right? So we do see st structure. It's just we're not getting all the data from that sample. Um, and you can do things to make it better, and we've done a little bit about that. Um, but the only solution is to make more. So this is urban legend, but I was talking to somebody maybe about 10 years ago now who was involved in the first Neanderthal genome. And I asked him how they did it. And he's like, well, the Germans want to get it done on time and only getting 1% yields. So what they did was they basically purchased 99 more machines, ran 100 times more data, <laughs> and it worked. It got done on time. It wasn't the most efficient, but that's what we're sort of stuck with, right? There isn't any good way of, of, of zooming in. Um, because we have more money, we'll go ahead and, and do more sequencing. So again, for some of these samples where it's clear we see interesting things, just do more sequencing. Again, we'll be still throwing away most of the data, but this haplotype data is actually real. So we actually have four different haplotypes. Now what's cool is that my colleague, Jason McLaughlin, he's actually gone and collected lots of trees with his undergrads, and so he actually knows the population structure and haplotype map of this area so today, not, not 10,000 years ago. And so we can actually see cool things in terms of the haplotypes today versus what it was 8,000 years ago. Um, and that doesn't really mean much, except for the fact that he's involved in a large consortium where they build mathematical models to make predictions, right? Given how climate changes and so on. And then the view of this is that this will be important because, again, if climate changes very often, right, we can then use this against that's what will happen to trees moving forward, right? If, if climate change is 10 degrees, one thing that actually happened in the past was when the ice went away, right? So, again, looking at how fast warming happens over time. Yeah, Chen. So, my question was. Was the grad student who was counting these by hand helping in verification of this method, or were they just? He's like now a professor. He doesn't do any counting anymore. OK. <laughs> so uh, partly because it takes forever, um, and give you guys hope if you're grad students in the audience. Uh, this actually is Jason McLaughlin, my collaborator at Notre Dame, who's an associate professor now, who's a PI of that big Paleon project's uh, graduate thesis. So I'm showing one of his slides. So I, you see two of my PhD slides, and this is actually Jason's slide. Um, they do do it now, um, but again, they're pretty well established. So these three lakes, uh, Ackerman, Young, and Green, are pretty well established study sites. And so most of the people who do modeling, they go back here because, again, it's a nice sense. And there's actually some data from Canada that's up here that also goes in here as well. So both between the Can Canadian groups and us, we have a really good sense of, again, upper Michigan, lower Canada uh, the structure of those populations. Yeah. Um, first, um, Sally Horn in geography does a fair amount of this. Uh, so if you ever want sure. to continue. Uh, second, when you were looking at the, the bands that you were doing to, on your method of, of trying to, to, to decide what um, the middle value is, I didn't see that you were like varying the width of the band that you were trying to ch choose for the endpoints. Yes. Between the grape and the apple and the mm -hmm. maize. Uh, and that seemed like an obvious sort of analysis to do and have a, a graph. So did you do that? We, we did. I think, and again, it, this is Olivia's data, and I give her credit. She's not IBM. Um, but it turns out that you don't get that much difference, that the most information is actually closest to your unknown position. Mm -hmm. And you get more when you move out, but it's sort of a fixed gain. Because right? again, if you get too far out, it's like a little problem, right? right? Too close is mostly good, but not always the case. Too far away is bad. And so we did look at multiple windows, and we do get some better performance. Uh, what we're hoping is that there are actually multiple biotech companies using this right now for their data. Mm -hmm. And they asked us to fix some bugs. I'm like, we'll fix the bugs for you, but let us know how it works. <laughs> and, and we can improve it. As you took the limit and as your band went down, did it collapse into a, s a standard method? Yeah, so the smallest one actually is just what we have for what we call quick impute, which is sort of the fast way of doing this. Yeah, so here, right? So. The smallest window is what we call this QI, which is the brown one. Mm -hmm. And then again, it's, it's the best, because again, the information that's closest. So it's sort of counterintuitive. You think having a longer window would be better. But for almost everything, the smallest window is good. 
It's just that when you have one red and one green, where it flips over, there aren't many good ways of doing that. And the way we addressed it, and that was the question that was asked earlier, is by using an SVM model, mm -hmm. train the model, and then use that to get a sense of which one is more likely. And that works better. The problem is you have to have lots of data, and you need to know where the actual windows are. Right? So here, we're doing it on the fly. For the other method, you actually know this is chromosome 20 at position 1 million. Right? And so you can go ahead and look at what's in there and build a model based on that information. We don't have that here. Well, I what I was thinking is, as your window got too narrow, you would lose your performance advantage. And you'd be... Right. Uh, yeah. And, and again, I don't, I don't care. I mean, I think what... And this is maybe, maybe I'll be really honest, I'm going to work with you guys. Uh, most of what we do is data parallel. And so if it takes too long, we just basically drive it up into pieces, then run it on a, a cluster. Right? So we have multiple NSF grants to go ahead and do that. Um, I mean, some things aren't like that. But again, by and large, we can always just break it up and, and solve it. Other questions? You had a question, Mike? Yeah, so I was curious. 90 you were talking about, you know, n you threw out 99% of the data. Um, what is that other data? It is mostly soil bacteria that live in anaerobic, because there's no oxygen down there, environments. Uh, it's other plants that aren't the ones we care about, but aren't, haven't, haven't been sequenced yet. So we get a lot of sort of off-target effects. Um, we also get a lot of sort of just weird stuff. We don't know what it is, because it's metagenomics, right? These are bacteria that are down there. Uh, and so what we do is, like most tools, is that we actually, uh, there's a method called centrifuge, and it builds a Burr's Willow transform on all of GenBank. And PWA is the same idea, right? So it's a, f a method to speed up the alignments. And we actually download all of GenBank and can very fast, quickly go through all of it and figure out the best possible match. And then we then look for the lowest common ancestor. So if it's, te if it's ambiguous, it could be either paper birch or white birch. We go ahead and look at the ancestor, say it's birch. So the data we actually show in, uh, sorry if it goes going through really fast. Yeah, here. Um, what we do is, is some of it actually is ambiguous. So we have this plot. If there's a difference, a SNP differentiates paper birch and white birch, we can say paper birch, right? It's pretty clear. But if it's not, we have basically phagus unknown, right? And so there is a lot of taxonomic ambiguity. The same problem was mentioned with regards to window sizes for edits. What ends up happening is that the best barcodes are conserved between trees, right? So you can build baits to rich for them. What that means, you get less taxonomic information, right? And so again, the best thing to pull down as a barcode tends to be the one that actually has the least information. <laughs> uh, but we tried, and this is Albrecht's question, we tried, and again, if we were not to have done enrichment, it would have been maybe one out of a thousand, right? So the fact that we even got one out of a hundred is entirely based on the fact that we sort of took the DNA, we stuck it to these probes, and only took the things that stuck. The unfortunate thing is other stuff sticks too, right? And so it's really hard to fully enrich. Does that mean that you can only really do this with uh, species that already have genomic resources available so that you can make sure that you're getting charged? Yeah, it sort of works. I mean, I think what, what's interesting is that the, the main species that are important for modeling climate change uh, you know, circa when the ice sheet went away 10,000 years ago uh, are largely sequenced, um, we still get weird stuff. So for example, there may be haplotypes that exist that haven't been sequenced yet, and then the best match is to an Asian birch, right? And obviously it's not in the US, and it, it's weird, and so what we do, we basically have a white list, and so again, if, if anything is not in the white list, we say, okay, we know that it's probably birch, but we don't know what it actually is, and that sort of helps a little bit for the, for the mapping. Um, but yeah, we get all kinds of weird stuff. The other thing I think was really interesting is that um, no matter how clean you are, uh, no HDN lab is actually really clean, so we actually have a blank that has lots of DNA in it, and we filter it. And so um, I'm not saying what grad students in their name eat, but it's like rice and banana and chocolate, <laughs> right? The DNA that you have in your hands, you're doing it, and again, it's clean, it's a room that has no DNA inside of it, um, but even water has DNA inside of it that corresponds to plants, and it's things that you would think that grad students may be eating, maybe chocolate more so than anything else in that list. Or coffee, if it was me. Not that much coffee in there. Maybe it's just uh, the food items. Okay, so as I mentioned, I uh, won't stick around too much. So uh, again, I will be here full time in January. I hope to come to the seminar as a visitor to see you guys here in, in the room and eat uh, cookies and drink coffee. It will not be until January 1. 
Uh, but feel free to email me. Uh, I do have a UTK email with my vol card. I won't use it probably. So uh, feel free to send me an email at my Notre Dame account for now. Um, again, happy to have Skype talk to you about various projects. And again, I will probably have at least two new students to work on cool stuff. It doesn't have to be a fully fleshed out project. Just say, Scott, it'd be cool to do this. Again, uh, I think it's the Confucius saying, every journey is one step, right? So let's take the first step and then the second step and, and so on. And look forward to meeting you guys more informally moving forward. Thanks. <laughs>